This Week in Radio Tech, episode 233, is brought to you by Lavo, maker of the new Crystal Clear virtual radio console. Crystal Clear is the radio console with a multi-touch touchscreen interface. By Omnia Audio and the incredible Omnia 9 and Omnia 11 audio processors. And by Axia and the Axia Radius audio console. Radius is within your grasp. A Nashville DJ complaining about an inconvenient EAS test unwittingly activates more EAS alerts across radio stations and cable systems. Plus, video streaming has a few radio stations becoming video providers, and ransomware has taken several radio stations hostage lately. How should engineers act to prevent their stations from getting hijacked? Chris Tarr and Chris Tobin join me for Twerks. Hey, welcome into This Week in Radio Tech. You know the drill. You know what the show's about. If you don't, Go catch up on all the other previous 232 episodes. I'm Kirk Harnack, your host, along with a cast of characters. We're going to do one of our fun shows today. We're going to hit a bunch of topics, bam, 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 about radio technology. What's going wrong in the world? How do we fix it? What's right? And, and all that. Our show is brought to you by the folks at Lavo, makers of the Crystal Clear uh, audio console, the touchscreen audio console. Also by the folks at Omnia. Got some cool things to tell you about that. And also brought to you by Axia. Axia connects to more other stuff than anybody else. All right, there we go. Sp sh um, commercials coming up. We'll put them in there one by one as we go along. Let's hit our uh, co-host, as usual, from Manhattan. The uh, Well, actually, he's not in Manhattan. He's, he's in <laughs> studio. He's in studio at the GFQ Network. The best dressed engineer in radio, it's Chris Tobin. Welcome in, Chris. Hello, Kirk. Yes, and we do have a guest tonight, Chris Tarr. But anyway. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> It's been a while. Come on, it's gonna be a fun show. We gotta have a little humor. Yeah, I'm here at the studios uh, tonight. This is good. This is fun. Oh, well, good. Glad, gl glad you could make it. Chris uh, Tobin is the proprietor of uh, IPCodex.com. Uh, don't go to the website. There's nothing there, but you can email him support at IPCodex.com. When he makes enough money, he'll get the website going. That's the way and, it works. Uh, <laughs> well, it's one step at a time. Like Dave Ramsey says, baby steps. Take baby steps. Baby steps. Well, that's why I have that's a telephone. Right. <laughs> That's right. So you uh, you consult people, tell them how to make their IP codex work, both for audio and for video. So we're glad to have you along in your expertise. And now, I, you know, I forgot what this guy looked like, except he posts his picture on Facebook every couple of days. Yes, the uh, the guy who hands out Halloween treats in Muckwanago, Wisconsin. It's Chris Tarr. Welcome in, Chris Tarr. Thank you for having me. Good to be here. Uh, we're glad to be had. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard that about you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So where are you? Uh, right now I am in uh, Hales Corners, Wisconsin. I think uh, my position has changed since the last time we spoke. Uh, I am back at my old position at Intercom as Director of Engineering for the Wisconsin stations. Uh, that's Milwaukee and uh, Madison. And uh, still volunteer for Radio Milwaukee, but, you know, built their brand new facility, got them going, and then there was nothing else to do. So there's plenty to do here with six you, radio you, stations. You fixed them up too good. I did too good of a job. Yeah, I kind of, yes. you know, I got it all done. It's like, well, what now? I was kind of sitting there waiting for something to break. So you know, I, I needed something a little more challenging. <laughs> I, you know, I knew you'd get bored with that thing. I, would, yeah. that, I mean, that you'd run out of stuff to do. It, yeah. Well, but, you know, the, the, the project that we did, it was a huge, fantastic project. Wouldn't trade, you know, wouldn't change that for the world. Had a lot of fun doing it. And, you know, it just turns out that uh, the people here have, you know, still had a lot of stuff for me to do. And so I came back and it was like I never left. It was like a weird sitcom episode where I woke up and there I was a year and a half later back at, at my desk with the same extension and everything. <laughs> They, never, they probably never changed it. And did all the remote they, controls still call you? Did you have to reprogram I, I was going to say, yeah, you know, the whole time the remote controls called me anyway. And, you know, I wouldn't be surprised <laughs> if my voice was still on the voicemail. So, you know, there you go. It was like deja vu all over again. Oh, man. Oh, engineering. It's just, it's like, but the thing at Intercom is there's a, there's probably a lot more employees there to break stuff. Oh, yeah. And, and, you then, know, just like, just like anywhere, they have new and creative ways every day to break things. So, uh, you know, there's, there's always something going on, but you know, I, again, you know, what was great about this is, uh, you know, in the time that I've been here, I've put on a translator, I've done a bunch of, uh, you know, a bunch of, uh, out in the field kind of things that I really missed, uh, when I was, when I was away at Radio Milwaukee, again, you know, they were great and I, I enjoyed what I did, but, um, you know, there's a lot of things now that are, you know, very much in my wheelhouse with what I do and, you know, with the, the RF side of things. So it was, you know, really good to get back and, and get going. And, you know, my employee of the month spot was still there and, you know, never left. So there you go. 
cool. All right. Well, glad you're back, and, and know that we've moved the time again. Uh, I hope you can make it back for more shows. Poor Tom Ray. He's usually driving or riding a train about this time. We I dearly hope we can get him back on a on a show or two, too. But we had plenty of guests over the summer. I, Chris, I don't know if you knew it, but while you were gone, uh, the show gained an employee. We have a booker now. Wow. So, yeah, the show has a booker. Uh, it's a guy who works for Telus named David Sarkis. Oh, and oh they- booker, booker with a B. I, I thought I was going to get paid for this episode, and I'm like, I'm in. Oh, booker. <laughs> I thought it was a smoking machine. Never mind. Oh, geez, I completely uh, misunderstood what that guy did. Okay. Jeez, <laughs> oh, I think it's time for a commercial, so we can. Uh, you guys can do your show research now. Uh, you, you have the email I sent you, right? You both have it, right? I, I've already done it. I, oh, I'm good, like you. Good. I come I come ready to go. <laughs> well, that's That makes one of us. Our show, This Week in Radio Tech, episode 233, is brought to you in part by the folks at LAVO, L-A-W-O, pronounced LAVO, and the website is LAVO, L-A-W-O, dot com. And the folks at LAVO want you to know about this console that we've been talking about ever since not long after the NAB show this year. It's the Crystal Clear Virtual Radio Mixing Console. Now, I got to say, this is cool. This is cool technology. And I like this because, folks, 22, 23 years ago, I wanted to see this tech happen. Touch screens to make faders move. I thought, wouldn't that be cool? And back then, I, you know, hey, that was kind of the dark ages, right? From, you know, for, uh, uh, not dark ages. I mean, there was good analog electronics going on and some digital stuff. And I was seeing touchscreens in a few applications. Uh, but uh, I thought, wouldn't it be cool to have a touchscreen to, to make things, uh, you know, to run faders up and down and bring in new sources and switch console uh, feeds? And I, back then, I talked to the folks at Auditronics in Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, could we do this? And yeah, you know, a little spark of light came on in their eyes, but thought they thought, now nah, we're too busy running a company, and that is just uh, uh, not yet. Well, the folks at Lavo have made it happen. Uh, the Crystal Clear Virtual Radio Mixing Console. Your Surface is a big honking multi-touch touchscreen. It's actually made by HP. They crank these things out. They're not that expensive. So guess what? If you ever, you know, just destroy it, if you drop an old cart machine on it <laughs> and it breaks, you can get a new one. And it's not the cost of the whole console. It's the cost of a touchscreen PC, uh, at least, you know, the, the controller part. It runs a terrific app that takes over the whole screen. You, you don't see Windows in there at all. It, it, your, your jocks, your talent are playing with a virtual radio console. You can touch it up to 10, ten fingers. If you got more fingers than that, I'm sorry you're out of luck. You're going to have to keep it down to 10. But you can run faders up and down, several of them up and down at the same time. You can touch buttons. And because the entire console is software-defined, that means that the folks at Lavo can make buttons very context sensitive, even more so than than with uh, other modern consoles that are still you know that still have but- physical buttons you push. Now you know a touchscreen console may or may not be for you, but if you think it's for you, let me encourage you to check it out on the website. Go to Lavo L A W O dot com and go to their uh, radio consoles area and then look into the Crystal Clear. Remember that name, Crystal Clear from Lavo. It's got all the stuff you'd expect to have. There is a there's a one rack unit box that goes in the rack. Doesn't have to go in the same room. There's no wire limitation that's short or anything. It's it's Ethernet connected over to the computer that's running your uh, your 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 touchscreen. Uh, it has three stereo mixing consoles: Program One, Program Two, and a record bus. Of course, it has Q. Uh, you can program different scenes and change scenes, as many consoles do nowadays. Uh, there's a panic button that clears any changes you made to the current scene. So if you know you're disc jockey, you messed the thing up, and you just need to get back to where you were, you just hit the panic button. Bam! You're you're back to your normal console setup. It has AES EBU in, ins and outs analog ins and outs, microphone inputs. It has optional Ravenna AOIP interface, which includes the AES67 standard uh, in in that Ravenna. Uh, It has power supply redundancy and, of course, GPIOs for on-air lights, tallies, things like that. So let me encourage you to check it out. It's uh, on the web at lavo, L-A-W-O, dot com. Uh, Look for radio consoles and the crystal clear console. Thanks a lot, Lavo, for sponsoring this portion of this week in radio tech. All right, gentlemen. The, the funny thing I keep thinking of when you were talking through this whole thing, I mean, it sounds like just really, really sweet tech, but I'm just, I'm, I'm picturing in the studio, one of our jocks going, nom, nom, nom. Hey, I got mayonnaise on this thing. How do you wipe <laughs> that off? 
I'm I don't know that the Lavo has it. I would assume that it does. <laughs> But at Scott Studios, when I, I worked for them in the mid '90s, and we had touchscreens, right? We were the touchscreen um, automation company back in the mid '90s. And somebody said, "How do I clean the screen?" And I'm firing all the all the jingles. Right. <laughs> and so, well, Dave Scott said, "That sounds like something we need to add." <laughs> so, Alt J, or maybe it was Control J, for janitor mode. That you know, you you laugh, but that actually, I just recently got touchscreens here with with wide orbit, and we had mm-hmm. the same question. Although you know, with these, you can actually turn them. You know, if you turn the screen off, it tur- it disables the touch. But we're uh, all like, yeah. how do we clean these things? And my <laughs> IT guy, who's you know was doesn't have a lot of history in radio, was like Captain Obvious. He's like, well, just turn them off. I'm like, <laughs> oh yeah, that's that's what I meant. I was just testing you to make sure you do what you're doing. Yeah. Well, on, on the Scott, uh, all, uh, it never occurred. I, I never thought of turning it off. I guess that would certainly work because I, I think the touchscreen got its – the touchscreen was an add-on. It was an ELO right. add-on yeah. touchscreen. Yeah. And, and uh, yeah, I guess it got its power from inside. But, yeah, there was Alt-J on the keyboard, and then you could wipe to your heart's content um, and then forget to put it back on. Your next source won't start, you know. So. Nice. <sighs> all right. You guys ready to hit these things? Oh, yeah. Everybody's favorite subject to argue about, EAS. What mm. went wrong with Bobby Bones and AT&T? Well, nothing Explain. went wrong. It, it worked exact, exactly as it's supposed to. He just initiated yeah. the wrong thing. So, <laughs> so the story goes that on the Bobby Bones show, he, he was upset um, because an EAS test, a real one, a test, came through during what? Some show he was watching. Was it a ball game? Was it one yeah, of those? It was a ball game. Well, it, I believe it was the national. It was, wasn't it the national EAS test? Well, well, yeah, that, that, a year well, or two ago. Yeah, well, no, no, no that, that's what he replayed accidentally. That's what he replayed. <clears throat> but he was upset because a real EAS test came through while he was watching a ball game, and he was upset about that. And the next day, or within a day or two, on his show, he you know is flying off the handle, complaining about what is this EAS test? Why does it have to come in the middle of my ball game? And switch my channel and put this. I can't watch anything except you know eighty two channels of of this awful text and this awful sound. So he goes into I guess some archives that they have at the station and plays for his audience. Here's what I heard on the air. Here's a sample of what I heard. And what he played, what he got his hands on, what his producer got his hands on, was a recording of that national EAS test that was done back in 2011 I believe that that you know the 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 FEMA White House everybody participated in to see how good or bad or broken or fixed EAS really is so he played that so it was a national level White House EAS thing national level emergency that was actually a test at the national level, which hadn't, hadn't, hadn't been done either before or for years, never been done with EAS, had been done with EBS. And that he played that on the air. And it went well, over his syndicated show, over Sirius XM, and it was carried, you know, all over the place. And what happened then? Well, here, I mean, here's the thing is, you know, first of all, I, you know, back this up to you, you know, you, you, you can't regulate stupid. Uh, <laughs> you know, this... If you're on the air, I, I know here at Intercom, when we hire new employees, they have to sign, you know, a, a form knowing, you know, stating that they know that rule and they will not do it. Uh, you know, the, it's it's not like this has never happened before and we're in uncharted territory. I mean, we've had several stations and networks get fined for playing ES tests as part of promos or on-air programming. You are not to do that. It's very, very clear. So, you know, first you've got somebody who's doing that who shouldn't be, number one. Number two, you've got some some units out in the field, some EAS units out in the field. There's an option called strict time. And what that does is it says to the EAS box, hey, if you hear something and it doesn't have the correct time, don't play it. And that's a, a, a thing you can configure on the receiver. Well, the stations that passed this along didn't have that enabled. They just They just heard that it was a national alert and forwarded it on dutifully, even though it was from several years ago. You know, now if they had that strict time turned on, it would have checked and said, "Oh, this is from two years ago. We're we're going to ignore it and log it, and we'd be done." And that would have stopped it right at the door. So, you know, the two things we have at play here is we still have to go a long way with our our staffs to say, "You don't ever do this, ever. I don't care what the circumstance is. You never do this." Number one. Number two, we need to do a better job, at least with the vendors, of educating 
uh, you know, the the people who are programming these boxes, or at least you know, uh, you know, make some some smart default settings or something where you know you don't have these things getting plugged in with that feature. I, I can't imagine many instances where you wouldn't want strict time. You know, I kind of thought about that when it happened. When why is that even an option? You know, if it's not the, if the time's not right. Uh, you know, you shouldn't play it, you know, and, and some people say, well, the you know, the reason you do that is if your clock is wrong on your box or, well, don't do that, <laughs> you know, do yeah. your job and make sure that everything's working and then this won't be an issue. So, I mean, that's, that's kind of my, you know, my feeling about this now, keeping in mind, you know, at least at intercom and I can say this now and, you know, we, we were, you know, we were guilty of doing that at promo long before this became a thing. You know, this was shortly after uh, EAS, uh, you know, came or the EAS system was really getting going with cap and things. And we had somebody put that in a promo and, and it got out locally. It didn't play on any station, but it got received. And, you know, we went to the commission and we, you know, we did all this stuff, but you know, it, it's, it's, you know, you just have to, you have to keep training people to say, I, I realize it might be a funny bit. Don't do it. Yeah. And we say, don't do it. Don't play any recordings of the famous duck fart sound and don't play the famous two-tone, that awful dissonant two-tone sound that was part of the old EBS test and it's still part of the EAS system as well. You, you mentioned um, that the, the, the de apparently the default in some – and there are different brands of EAS boxes that radio stations, that cable head ends, that TV stations have installed, different brands. And I guess – I'm sure each manufacturer has different default settings. This notion of, of you know, don't follow the, the strict time. Uh, uh, you know, let everything, let it, let any alert that comes in be a valid warning. Um, and, you know, you might ask, why isn't strict time turned on? Why, why is that not the default? Right. And and, on some boxes it is. And that, you know, oh. just some aren't. And, and, and here, I mean, we can back up even, and I have a good example of where how things can go wrong with programming from just two weeks ago here in Wisconsin, and uh, it kind of made a little bit of news. We had the um, uh, nuclear power plant up in northeast Wisconsin uh, wanting to do a test with just their local stations with a nuclear with a nuclear power plant warning. That's actually a thing. <laughs> That's actually a code in EAS, and they wanted to test it with their local stations to make sure that if they sent it, the stations would get it and air it and everything. Well, they did it incorrectly, and it managed to start to propagate across the state. Well, what happened was there were several boxes, again, where people just left the defaults, and that code that was only actually sent for that county, stations, you know, rebroadcast it and it kept going down the chain because some of these boxes selected the entire state for that warning, even though, you know— the reason they have the codes set up that way is you can say, well, if it's not in a county that I care about, don't do anything with the alert. Sure. And, you know, I, I actually, it turns out it gotten as far as Minnesota, <laughs> you know, that it got, you know, sent along the chain because there was a station right on the border who sent it and again said, you know, all of Wisconsin. And then there was a station who had a county in Wisconsin on their list. And sure enough, it played there for something that was, you know, not only was it a, a test, but it was hundreds of miles away. And so, I mean, what we get back to with strict time and with coverage areas and things like that is, you know, with, with engineers being as busy as they are sometimes, they look at these boxes and just kind of load the defaults or don't really take the time to understand what these functions do. And they'll say, well, if it's a nuclear thing, it should be, well, I want to you know, probably just need to be statewide. And you go, well, no, <laughs> you know, we don't have a nuclear power plant here. So why would I care? You know, if, if there's something that, you know, we need to know about. So, you know, strict time is that thing, too. That's why in this situation, not all stations rebroadcast that alert. It was just some. And of those stations, and I won't start mentioning brands, but there was a certain brand where that was strict time was, dis was disabled by default. And mm -hmm. mostly those were the boxes that repeated the, the alert. This is actually something uh, uh, that Chris Tobin can probably speak to. Having worked with a manufacturer Chris, uh, we, we talk about it at Telos when we're, you know, in design meetings and figuring out, you know, what, sh what should be the defaults. And, and we often refer to the phrase that's famously part of the, the computer world, the tyranny of the default. Because whatever you make the default is probably what's going to be out there in 98% of all units because people often don't change the default too often. There are still HD radio signals that are transmitting the station 
identifier, the call letters or whatever you want to be known by, as HD underscore one. And really? Isn't that one of the first things you do when you put an HD exciter on the air, when you, uh, you know, give it, a, give it the call letter you want to appear on the radio instead of HD underscore one? Chris Tobin, talk to us about the tyranny of the default. Oh, <clears throat> tyranny of default actually is, uh, is, is handy. The problem I think we're experiencing in what you mentioned with the uh, HD underscore one, as Chris pointed out with, uh, you know, what shouldn't happen is we as an industry no longer educate, uh, teach, whatever you want to call it, uh, mandate, uh, you know, embrace the new things or old stuff. I can tell you, speaking from personal experience from working in radio stations, when it came to EAS, nobody wanted to touch it. No one was interested in playing with it because if something went wrong, it was uh, your bottom that was on the on the grill. And then when you move to the default thinking, the tyranny of default from a manufacturer's side of things, a lot of manufacturers fail to try to talk with customers and learn a little bit of what the industry is doing and say, okay, if we go with these defaults, maybe what we do is put a disclaimer with a uh, you know right across the front of the unit, not a disclaimer, but a piece of paper. Because I remember years ago, I used to get certain equipment and have this bright colored card uh, adhered to the front panel where you couldn't miss it. And it would clearly state, do this or do that or beware. Not saying that's the easiest solution, but I think a lot of it, and Chris's point, is it's educating the staff. It's We as the industry need to really embrace what are we going to do. I'll use an example. I worked just recently with a uh, local law enforcement group on a couple of communication things, and I, I asked them, I said, well, how do you make sure that the people in the radio cars know what's going on, how to handle this new thing they're working with? And they showed me this little protocol book, and I was like, oh, interesting. First page, five bullet points. It was for the quick and easy, I don't have time to read the other 30, 32 pages. And mm-hmm. I looked at it, I was like, wow, this really makes sense. And they went in, and what they also told me was they went to the people in the field and said, what don't you want the box or the devices to do? And they said this, 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 and this. They went back and turned off or turned on the defaults they wanted. So that's, what? it's a two-sided, I think it's a two-sided approach. And I, I mean, I get, you know, I get the point of of some of the manufacturers turning the strict time off. Uh, you know, thinking that if somebody's going to put in the defaults, you know, it'll broadcast things that you probably don't want to hear, but at least it will broadcast the things that should be broadcast. So I, I kind of understand the thinking behind it because it's kind of a safety, you know, it's a kind of a catch-all thing. It's a PR you thing. Know. Yeah, well, yeah. And I, I'm I'm imagining they never thought that, you know, somebody was going to sit there and, and mess around like that. It's the, you know, the unintended use there. Right. Uh, but I, 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 you know, I believe they kind of went, well, you know, if we put strict time on, there's a possibility that somebody will screw up the time zone or something like that. And, you know, the alerts won't run and, you know, there's a safety issue there. So let's turn the strict time off and we'd rather, you know, have the box by default pass things that aren't meant for it and go up oh, that, you know, don't pay attention to that, but pass the things that are, you know, that are legitimate rather than not pass anything at all because of, you know, user error or something like that. But, it, you know, that's kind of lazy. <laughs> and it's like, you know, you really, if, if, you know, if anything there, there, you're right, there needs to be kind of a bullet point. Hey, if, you know, and, and again, your EAS, they're, they're not easy boxes to program. Now, you know, Sage does a pretty good job with their software and, you know, they kind of have, you know, but even they could do better with kind of, you know, tell us where you are and we can at least program some, you know, some important things for you. Uh, but they, they don't do that. But at least do kind of the, if you skip everything else, here are the things you need to know. Yeah. You know, by default, this is what this box will do. If you don't want that to do that, then you need to start changing these settings. You know, how accurate are the clocks on these things? And are they settable to NTP? Yes, the new ones are. Yeah. Okay. Okay. But that doesn't mean that somebody won't change that and set a time zone incorrectly or, you know, something yeah. like that. Yeah. So do you think that strict time ought to be defaulted on? I do not. Here no. I, I, I think that's a bad idea. Ah, okay. So, so strict time ought to be off. That's Yeah, that's my opinion. You think? Okay. Yeah. Or no. Well, uh, no, no, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm backwards. I, want, I think okay. it should be on. <laughs> okay, okay. I, that's why I was scratching my head. I was, I was wondering. <laughs> yeah, I, I was well, like, Chris, oh, wait a minute. Chris no, must no, have no, a reason for on. that. So. Yeah. <laughs> No, you, you so, would want it on. And, and again, because if you program your box correctly, the time will always be correct and, you know, it'll always be set to NTP because it's part of the cap spec. So, uh, 
you know, if you have everything set correctly, strict time on won't harm anything. It'll actually help and it'll prevent things from being broadcast that shouldn't be broadcast. Should somebody at iHeartMedia have to pay a fine? Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, the reason I say that, I mean, that's there's a precedent for it already. I mean, you know, it's been, you know, it's already been stations have been fine for doing it. So, I mean, it's not arbitrary or capricious. And and second of all, I mean, you know, it's the only way to get the message across, apparently, because, you know, people are still doing it. And it is a safety issue. I, you know, I... The, I was at a, the local SBE meeting the other night and we, this came up and, you know, sure enough, a couple of the retired guys go, yeah, I barely, you know, I never pay attention when that comes on anymore. Cause it's just whatever, you know, and, and this affects that in a, in a way, you know, in a major way, people hear about these things and they stop taking it seriously. And that's when people get, get hurt. Now we can debate all we want about EAS being the most effective way to do this. You know, I mean, it's, you know, we can argue about the FEMA involvement. You know, there's a lot of things about that, but you can't argue with the boy who cried wolf syndrome. And and if we keep, you know, and even if it never got rebroadcast, the fact that it was on the air as a radio bit, uh, you know, takes away from it when it actually happens. And, yeah. you know, it's it's just they have to know that this is serious. Yeah, our conversation here amongst us three engineers has been to look at the technical aspects, but uh, which which we should get right. Of course, we should get right, and I fear that too often we don't get right. Um, well, speaking for me, not for you, of course. But but the the programming aspect, yes, that's uh, you know it, it, it took both to make all this happen, and it shouldn't happen uh, from from either side, programming or technical. Well, remember, well, this- remember EAS. You know, you can voluntarily opt out. And if you choose, then you don't have to worry. But if you opt in, it's part of the rules, and the rules say what you have to do and what the consequences are. And and if this wasn't, if this was the first time, I would say absolutely. Just say you know, use this as a teaching thing, and you know, let's move on. We, there we I go. guess we, we lost Chris. Chris. Not just for a second. Oh, we've got. Oh, he no, he, he's there. Chris, say something. This is Chris Tobin in uh, in Queens. Ah, okay. <laughs> we've lost, we've lost our connection. Let's move on then to the next subject as we uh, get Chris Tarr back. Um, is and, and 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 this is good for both of us. But Tobin, you're going to jump right into this. Uh, I'm going to jump to number three. Is video destined to be a new part of radio via streaming? And the reason I ask is um, a uh, uh, a very uh, successful. Uh, equipment dealer for radio and television based in Miami, uh, a, a dealer that is a, a, a good partner with uh, my employer, Telos. They are selling a software system that uses multiple cameras. It uses, um, it, it'll take a video feed from your automation system instead of playing music only. It's now, you're now playing music video and uh, you have Great control over the whole thing. It's easy to, when you get it set up, it's easy to look good and have a video stream of your radio station with as much or as little involvement as you want from the from the songs. There are stay, plenty of Latin stations in, in Buenos Aires and in, in Brazil and uh, in uh, Bogota, Colombia. There are stations in Mexico City. Stations have put this thing on the air. Uh, I believe the, the manufacturer is called Avra, A-V-R-A, and there are others too. But this one uh, is is one that I picked up on. They've got a, a really good promotional video on YouTube. It's in Spanish. I help to uh, voice the English version of it. I'm not saying that it's as slick as it should be because it's still Spanish talent with overdubs of English. But you get the idea. And this is pretty compelling. You look at the promotional video for this, and it shows people listening to the radio and uh, being in, being reminded about the video stream that the radio station has. You may want to tune into it to see the the, the talk show talent in, in the room, to uh, to see the, the 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 song videos, to see commercials in a video format, and it shows people picking up their iPad, picking up their phone, their smartphone, and starting the station's app and streaming video. And yeah, I know there's bandwidth. Yeah, I know there's plenty of complications. It's I'm not saying it's easy to do, but it's pretty compelling. Chris Tobin, what do you think about radio stations doing more and more of this video streaming? And at what point do you think it'll just be uh, something that we do, of course? Well, it's 10 past 10 years overdue. But yeah, absolutely. 
It's, you know, radio, let's go back to the history books. Radio has always been about the experience. Whether it was the 1929 broadcast from KDKA in Pittsburgh, or it's the broadcast you hear today in 2014. It's the experience and the audience and what they get from it. And it's about that. And the video component makes total sense. And it's just a natural evolution. But we as broadcasters are stuck in our ways. Why? Because... We're in a comfort zone trying to make the best number of dollars and pennies we can, and we're afraid to fail or do anything because that's just the way things have morphed in the business. What you described is something that should have been happening for the last 10 years and hasn't. And they're absolutely right. In other parts of the world, they're doing this as common practice. I know in Europe, I've seen a few sites, a couple of radio stations that do the same thing. It's excellent, and it makes total sense. Now, now, I, I worked at a facility where we yep. tried to do that, yeah. and we were told... That it's all wrong, that will break the radio station. That was the phrase. <laughs> it'll break the radio station because it, it'll cannibalize our primary audience. I'm like, what are hmm. you talking about? They're listening to the station. Now you're offering them an opportunity to see inside the box. What, are you kidding me? They don't want to have anything to do with it. You know, I, I look at other networks, um, like, for example, um, well, this very network right here. Th this is audio and video. And a good number of people who enjoy this podcast, partake of it, get the video, get the audio only version. And a good number of people do, do the video. Now I'm, I don't know. I, I think Andrew Zarian with GFQ started with video, but you go back years ago, however many, nine, 10 years ago. And, uh, uh, they had that other network, the twit network, uh, they started with audio only, and then they added video. And at first it was pretty schlocky video. And then, you know, now they got a big operation. Um, I just got to believe that, and you know, if you watch, you can enjoy Andrew's podcast, you can enjoy other podcasts audio only, but if you've got the bandwidth and you've got the eyeballs and you got the time, the video is pretty entertaining. It's kind of compelling to watch people argue about whatever it may be, whether it's what the tech, uh, and, and Paul Therat arguing about windows and, and talking to, to Andrew about that, or whether it's Matt men or the Friday free for all it, behind wh the whatever counter. show it is behind the counter. It's, it's. It's interesting to watch people talk about things that you're interested in anyway. It does add a dimension. If you've got the time, if you're driving, probably not a good idea. But sitting in your office, commuting on a train, in the backseat of the car, probably, you, know, you can do this. And I, to me, radio is kind of the same way. Uh, if it's, if it's voice-tracked, obviously there's not a lot of action going on. And some of the stations that I've seen are, are simply cameras in the studio and when there's a music, when there's a song playing, they're just playing a, you know, a flipping logo or just have a camera on the studio, which is pretty boring. Um, but yeah, that's the cheap way. Th that's the cheap way, although that's the first entrance into that. In American Samoa, we've actually been doing this for about five years now. We have it's not an automatic system. We, uh, we have four lipstick cameras in the, in the room. A uh, wide shot and three close shots. We have we pay a guy to come in. He's part of the morning show and he manually video switches the show. We don't have any music video. It's it you know it's a traditional radio station. So on we're on the cable network. We're not streaming this. And some of the infrastructure for um, uh, 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 for internet is not that great. So it's on the cable. We have a cable channel. And when the jocks are talking, you see the jocks. And when they're not talking, you see textual stuff going by while the music plays. But it's, so so the next version of this is is what uh, some Avra users are doing now. Uh, and and we'll put this in the show notes. You can see a, a few stations doing this, where they're where when they have a video version of the of the song that they're playing, you'll see the video along with that. And uh, and then there's you know lower thirds, and you can have Twitter feeds and and local weather and and all that business going on um, uh, on this 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 video feed. I believe it's compelling if you just start simple, and I believe it's pretty darn compelling if you go whole hog with it. Absolutely. It adds a dimension. It's sellable. It's you know it's a revenue source, and it's just also it engages your audience, so it brings them to you. Um, it, there was a place on the west coast of group. Uh, I think it's Alpha Broadcasting, if I remember correctly. They have a group of stations where they were doing a video component, and they did it very well. And they had a green screen in in the uh, in the booth, and during the songs, they would do shots and create little videos and vignettes that would play on the stream and be part of the. You know, the, the video stream itself. So they created content within the radio show. And it, it complemented ah, okay. what they were doing. Okay. Now, yeah. was yeah. it was it intensive and did it require a lot of labor? Yeah. But then again, that's what you do. That's what business is. That's the problem that we have in broadcasting. As you pointed out, you know, it's going to be costly. Oh, I have to hire somebody to switch video. Really, is it worth my time? 
Well, it is if you then take the next step, which is bring it out to people and make money from it. Just like you did when you bought the radio station and put the transmitter up and you said, well, is anybody going to tune in and listen? I guess they will. That's the, you know, it's what you have to look at. It's an adjunct to what you're doing. It's not uh, an inconvenience. And, I, and I've worked with a few folks over the years that when they talk video in the studio, it's like, oh, you know, wait a minute. No, that's, that's going to break <laughs> everything. And that's what's happened. And then you have the other side of the coin where it's like, well, if we can do this and that with the stream, we'll just make oodles of money because we can automate it. And nothing happens to that. And then you get the phrase, they can't monetize the net. Mm. <laughs> Chris Tarr, you got anybody doing video? We don't right now. And, you know, there's, there's, I think there's arguments for and there's against. One of the arguments uh, against is, uh, first of all, does it really bring anybody new into the fold and it doesn't engage them anymore? Uh, you know, for example, in Morning Drive, nobody would be watching. You know, people are commuting. That's what they're doing. They get to work and, and you know, so do we lose, you know, the question becomes, do we lose anything by doing it or do we really, you know, is there a whole lot to gain? And, you know, we, we've looked at both sides of the coin. We've kind of dabbled in it a little bit. And it just seems at this point, it didn't really move the needle enough for us to, to you know, dive in. Now, outside of doing that live, we do a ton of video. We have, in fact, where I'm sitting right now is the guy who produces all of our video. We do a lot of video, just not the, the real time of people in the studio. It's, um, you know, inter, you know the, the kind of the, like we call them the viral video kind of things that we do. And we do a lot of those. And those we actually, you know, those are impactful. Those are things that uh, basically engage listeners outside of just listening to the radio. They'll go, you know, see it off the website or through Facebook or through these alternative channels. And in those situations, that's where we're really getting the return. When we were just throwing the morning show up on the web and, you know, with the cameras and things, it was neat. And, you know, there are people who certainly enjoyed watching. But, you know, I, the, I think sometimes we had the people on the air kind of more concerned about what's going on in the video than what's going on <clears throat> in the audio. Ah. Number one. And and number two, it just was, like I said, it was one of those situations where, you know, it, there just wasn't enough people watching to really make that worthwhile. So, yeah. you know, it may, it may happen down the road and I've seen some people do it uh, in a way that's just fantastic. But again, it's like in a lot of ways, you know, who's going to sit there and really watch that? You know, I mean, it, there are some people we just haven't found, you know, anything that uh, goes on the air as compelling as some of these other things, you know, the, the YouTube videos and, and, you know, some of these people who, you know, that's their thing. It's kind of, you know, it's kind of that whole, you know, there's a reason they don't do radio. There's a reason we don't do real-time video <laughs> like that. You know, I mean, it just, there, there's something, there's something to that. Now, having said that, again, you know, there are some, there are some radio stations that are pulling it off and doing it a very compelling way. But I think they're doing radio differently to accommodate that. Somehow, in what you just said, somehow that old uh, joke or phrase comes to mind. I don't know. I'm making this up. But uh, you know, the Italian baker said to the banker, you don't bake a bread, I don't the cash the checks. That's right. <laughs> so, exactly. Stay with, our, um, stay with our core business. But I got to tell you, you know, sometimes I throw up uh, a uh, on the TV in the bedroom, getting ready in the morning, going in and out of the bathroom. And uh, I, you know, I got I, I got a new show on or the, the Today Show of some kind. And if... If one of my local radio stations with a wacky morning crew had a video feed uh, on the internet or on cable, I might watch it. I, I might very well watch it. Um, you know, if, if I got, got a little bit of news, a little bit of weather, some songs, you know, uh, watching watching uh, Fox 17 or Fox News or the Today Show, uh, I'm not getting any music. I am getting plenty of news. Right. And here's the thing is that's a situation where that would probably work. Now we have a sports station and I think that probably throwing cameras in there would be pretty fun, but you know, for a music station, I just don't see, there's not a lot going on there in the two minutes that they're talking and then the 10 minutes of everything else. I just yeah. don't see a lot of compelling things that you wouldn't just get from having the radio on in your bedroom, but like a sports talk station where you'd actually have guests on and you know, you would have some things that are probably pretty, could be pretty visual. I could certainly see that as, as being something you could pull off. But, you know, let's be honest, when these guys are on the air, what are they doing? They're doing just what we're doing right now and, and, and talking. And if that's something that you can hear in real time, you know, would you really want to see that in real time? Mike, um, Mike, um, I was, I Mike Francesco came to mind, uh, Chris Tobin, uh, that you had on your CBS stations. A lot of video came out of that. Are they still doing that? 
Yeah, yeah. He's doing it with he's doing it with Fox now. But uh, yeah, we had ah, Boomer oh, and Carton. That, that turned into a real network show. Oh yeah, yeah. That started out as local stuff, and then with uh, local cable, and just moved on. Uh, mm. You know, Chris is right. Sports, you could definitely do a lot with that. Music, you might have to be a little more creative and try stuff. What radio station did I pass through last year? Was it? They were doing music videos in between the jock breaks, and then they they were creating, as you put it, the viral or what I called vignette videos, interspersed with it to uh, sort of break it up a bit, and. They did. They had a local sports guy do a quick sports update during the music. It was interesting. It was. It was definitely. I think they were trying to figure out where their place was, but it was definitely an attempt to make things happen. Mike Francesa, Boomer and Carton uh, at the CBS stations um, do a video both on the radio. Uh, sorry, do a show both on radio and on on TV. And just as you point out, Kirk, with Boomer and Carton and Mike Francesa, but Boomer and Carton in the morning, people would put it on just in the bedroom or in the kitchen, yeah. wherever and. They'll walk around and do their thing and listen. You know, something, just me, maybe it's just me, but I've always been very intrigued by the, the different visualizations that come with Winamp or uh, iTunes, uh, and I'm sure there's, there may be even better ones than, than, than I've seen. Um, I don't have to have the music video to go along with the music, but I'd like to have something visual, something besides an empty chair in the control room. So Chris Tarr, you mentioned a green screen. So you'd have a green screen behind some talent, and whether they were there or not, you could have it look like there's a visualization going on, uh, whether it's the station logo spinning around or real, real-time real computer-generated visualizations that go along uh, to the beat of the music. Uh, that, that would be something uh, on the screen to at least you know have a reason to keep it on until they actually came on the air and, and said some stuff and you were looking at it. Well, it was, it was actually... Chris Tobin who said that, but, oh. <laughs> but here, my two cents on that is that's great. But then we're getting back to, that's not really compelling. That's not a compelling offering for video here. Okay. Let's look at a visualization where we play radio. You know, I mean, that, it, that's kind of what I'm getting at is at least on a music station. Now, again, there are a few who invested a lot of money into making their studio video friendly and, and mm. in a way that made sense. And in those rare instances, there is something compelling to watch in between the breaks and that sort of thing. But, you know, when you get into throwing a visualization on, then really all you're doing is talking about video for three minutes every 15 minutes. And yeah. in that case, you know, what's the upside to that? You know, I mean, are you, you going to make money off that? Are you going to get more listener or more viewers? Uh, you know, I, I kind of, you know, it's kind of like that whole, if we're going to get away from our core of what we do, Let's make sure that we can do it as well as the core things that we do. So it's like, well, you know, first and foremost, we're a radio station. So let's do that well. Now, as we try to branch off into these other things like streaming and video, we need to do those well, too. We can't be a radio station that also kind of does video and kind of does this. And, you know, kind of like what we did when we started with the Internet and with streaming audio and things like that. It's like we're just throwing it out there, you know. Oh, yeah, we got a website. You can just click right here to listen to us. And that's about all we do. Or Facebook, you know, yeah, we, we put something on Facebook and like us, you know, you, you have to, you know, then that, you have to do it as well as you do radio. And that's what concerns me at the, about the video component is, I mean, that's great. And in some like sports and those things, it, it's a really compelling thing, but I just don't believe it's for everybody in radio. Yeah. Yeah. It's not for everybody, but you definitely have to take it seriously as though you are doing business. As you point out, Chris, that's exactly the way to go. Let's stop and do some business now ourselves. What a great segue. Oh, it's just awesome. This is This Week in Radio Tech, episode 233. It's uh, Kirk Harnack along with Chris Tobin and Chris Tarr. We're talking about a few technical subjects, EAS, video for radio. And coming up, we're going to be talking about ransomware. <laughs> Good topic here, just before Halloween. Uh, and Chris is going to, Chris Tarr will update us on the uh, Wisconsin Broadcasters Association, what uh, some of the things that happened there. What, do you, what did he learn? Our show is brought to you in part by... Omnia. We haven't talked about Omnia in quite a while. Oh, my goodness. There is so much going on at Omnia that you've got to go to the website and check it out. Here are a few headlines in the news. Uh, if you click on these links, you're going to be just delighted with things like Leif Clayson explaining undo at the AES 2014. This is a great webinar uh, with Leif explaining how does undo. What is undo? You know these records that we get? Records. You know these CDs, these audio files that we get now to play on our radio stations and their square waves? Well, uh, Omnia 9 fixes that. Leif Clayson and, uh, and his colleagues have come up with incredible algorithms that actually make 
squashed, crushed songs sound good. And then, of course, we process them ourselves <laughs> in the way that you want to, not the way that the record producer may have uh, unknowingly uh, messed it up. Also, there's a webinar uh, with Leif Clayson doing a really deep dive into the Omnia 9 processor and how to make it walk and talk and sing and dance and, just, and how to get through it. I mean, there's a lot of options in the Omnia 9 uh, audio processor. You know, something else new, the Omnia 9 S now includes... AM processing along with FM processing at no price increase. Check that out. If you've got an AM station you need to process, you got a, you can have a backup processor uh, just that way, switching it between AM and FM. Um, and I, I think it actually does both at the same time. So check that out on the web. Um, there's there's a, a new uh, processing algorithm in the Omnia 11, the real flagship of the Omnia line. It's called Solar Plexus. It is. It will just rattle your bones, and I don't mean by playing you distorted bass. It is just incredible what what uh, Frank and his uh, uh, processing team, Cornelius Gould, Rob Dye, Mark Manolio, what they've done to um, uh, to take audio in the bass area and make it just so powerful and musical. Not not unmusical, but absolutely gorgeous. Frank Foti has a a, a YouTube video uh, about this. Um, uh, so all these things, uh, so much information is on YouTube. If you go to OmniaAudio.com, go to that website, and click in the lower right-hand corner, there is the Omnia YouTube channel. It's actually a playlist uh, of YouTube videos about some of the latest thinking about audio processing and how we can make things solid, consistently good, consistently beautiful, tonally balanced, and not distorted. Also, it just it just kills me how we have this this thing that Leif Clayson does with uh, with uh, injecting the the audio pi the, the stereo pilot uh, into an FM station where your left and right channels are over a hundred percent and yet your total modulation is under a hundred percent. It's just it's like a building that's bigger on the inside than it is on the outside. I, I'm just <laughs> just so tickled about this stuff. Uh, there's also options for audio processing for uh, web streaming like the Omnia One multicast. The uh, Omnia 9 has, uh, has options for this built into it, so you can use the Omnia 9 for your web streaming uh, audio processor. Um, there's options for, uh, um, for confidence monitoring built into some of our processors at Omnia. Check them all out. It's just, there's just it's so much going on there. Uh, the, uh, also, our relationship with Sound 4, uh, where you have mic processing and uh, IP streaming uh, as an STL to your transmitter site built into some of the products at Omnia. Again, check it out on the web at um, omniaaudio.com. The YouTube channel is worth your time. Just start that playing and, uh, and find out what's new. All right. Thanks, for, uh, thanks to Omni Audio for sponsoring this week in Radio Tech. All right, gentlemen, let's move on. Chris Tarr, Chris Tobin are both with us here on episode 233. And a big thing in the news lately has been ransomware. A number of radio stations have been hit with one of the ransomware malware programs that are out there, uh, turning an entire automation system into just gibberish. What, uh, what do we do about this? How, what causes it? What can stations do to keep this from happening? Uh, does it boil down to stupidity again? Does it boil down to things that engineers can do to assist in protecting against ransomware and turning your station into a big blob of random numbers? Well, here, here's hard. the thing. Yeah. Here's the thing is, you know, is I think a lot of the engineers, at least I, you know, I can speak for myself for years, I've been banging the drum about don't put your automation system out on the internet. However, the pushback you get from the air staff a lot of times is just brutal because it makes their life easier. And, and I, I, you know, because you can, you know, if, if, you know, if you're not good at networking, you know, you almost have to do that in order for them to do what they need to do. Otherwise they're sneaker netting. But, um, you know, I don't know how many times, you know, somebody said, well, you know, we need to get the studio, uh, you know, automation playback machine, um, you know, on the internet so that we can log into it remotely, or we need to be able to play audio off the web or, you know, there are all kinds of things. Or, you know, my, my computer at my desk, I need to be able to access the automation system. And that's where a lot of this is coming from. And, you know, I've always, you know, been very good about saying no, 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 no. And, you know, doing some different things with, uh, you know, physical land separation and dual networks or intermediary servers and things like that to, to kind of do it. But it, you know, it's never been easy for them. And so I, I can totally see how this happens where, and, and I know of a lot of stations where, 
their primary automation machine is on the internet because it, you know, for whatever reason. So I, I think everybody is aware of the dangers, but I think in a lot of ways it's either they're not sure of the best way to get it off the internet and still be able to retain some functionality and probably also, you know, there's some pressure from the staff to to not do that, to make things really easy for them. And that generally requires, you know, putting everything on the same network. So then what happens is it just takes somebody to open up an email or an attachment that they shouldn't and it gets yeah. out, out of the network and that's it. You're, you're done. So, you know, at the, at the very least, make backups of everything, <laughs> you know. But, uh, you know, your, net, your, your automation system has, uh, has just got to be separated from everything else. It just has to be. And there are ways that you can make the two networks talk together that, you know, reduce the risk. There are things you can do to, you know, to, to make things at least a little bit easier. But, uh, you know, nowadays you just can't, you can't do that. You know, it just, this is, it's good. We're going to keep seeing this. So uh, I'm going to go to Tobin in a second. Let me let me thumbnail this just a little bit because from my understanding, and I, I do follow this news quite a bit, uh, typically what happens with ransomware is uh, somebody gets uh, a, a, uh, a file in their email or they're encouraged to go to a website, and you can get drive-by malware just by visiting a website, not having to click on anything, depending on how the malicious attack, what vector it's designed to come in on. But the point is a salesperson, a secretary, an engineer maybe, a program director, a disc jockey, somebody clicks on something they shouldn't have. A, a, a pop-up comes up and says, your computer might have a virus. Check here to, to find out. Well, that's the virus. That's what does it. And ransomware is is uh, has been extremely lucrative uh, for a, a couple of companies so far because what it does, it, it, it quickly installs on, on your computer. It um, there's they, The people who write ransomware go to incredible lengths to remain anonymous, like you must pay with Bitcoin, and the, the servers that, they, that, that are used are just so randomized uh, the, 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 all over the world. And uh, it, it's, it's taken months and months of, of, uh, of, of companies you know, checking into how this works to even come close to, to finding out who these people are. But um, the, 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 the malware gets on your computer and it goes and encrypts every file it can find or every file of, of in certain categories, doc files, photo files, movie files. Um, it doesn't necessarily encrypt everything, but files that are important to you that you can't go replace some other way, like re-downloading a, 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 an installation file, uh, it, 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 it goes and encrypts all these files that you only have one copy of. And then it also does this for any attached drives, um, network attached drives. So if you're a salesperson and one of your attached drives goes to, I don't know, the traffic department or, heaven forbid, uh, some automation drives that are that are common to your radio station, maybe you have some network attached storage, it'll go encrypt those files. And this happens pretty quickly. Then, then you get to pay a bunch of money to... to to try to get these files back. And uh, I'm told sometimes it doesn't work, sometimes it does. And of course, you, uh, our, our government and uh, authorities tell us, you know, don't pay the ransom. Um, so, so you have, these files are no longer useful to you. And if it's shared files that other people like automation system or traffic department or billing department uses, then you're really, you're really up a creek. Um, and, and so, Chris, you were talking about, about separating networks. Uh, sometimes that's not even entirely possible, but it, after explaining all that, what I want to get at is this. Uh, plenty of engineers use uh, freeware to access remotely their computers. VNC and its various derivatives are very popular. But typically, VNC remote access, the way it's typically done is by opening a port on your firewall, maybe using a, a high port number to kind of sort of obscure it, not using the standard 5900 port number. But point is, a lot of people use freeware to act to remotely access internal computers, but it's fixed, and the only thing protecting you at that point is a password. Uh, and I don't know how well VNC can be hacked otherwise if you don't know the password. But here's and here's my point. Now I'm finally getting to it. If you use some of these paid services like TeamViewer or Go to My PC, that where you have a full time rendezvous server and you have full time encrypted connections. And the ports, if not random, randomized, they, they move around, they can change. I guess what I'm saying is I haven't heard of cases of people remotely exploiting these paid services like TeamViewer or GoToMeeting uh, or GoToMyPC and, and, and other similar ones, LogMeIn. Um, I haven't heard of those being exploited or at least proven that, that they're exploited. What are your feelings about free... But 
things that you set up kind of permanently. Let me let versus, me versus versus these these dynamic ones. Go ahead. Let me stop you right there. Yeah. The minute the minute you say those free services, that means that computer's got to be out on the internet. So no, absolutely not. Uh, you, you know, because in order for log me in, team viewer, any of those things to find the rendezvous server, that machine needs to be able to get out to the network. If it can get out to the network, that means it's got to be networked with other things and therefore can be infected. So are you really saying that because a computer is signed up for go to my PC, it can be infected? Absolutely. Because it, it can be, it, that means it, it's touching somewhere else. That's what I'm saying. Your automation system needs to be on an island that can't see those things. I mean, because it, if it can see those things and other things can see it. So what you're really looking at is you're looking at you needing to open. A, what you really want to do is do a VPN into somewhere and then from there launch an internal connection so that that, you know, you're you're you secure that way. That's the thing. I mean, it, it does just because it hasn't been, you know, that vector hasn't been exploited doesn't mean it can't be. And the, that that. You know, that means that if TeamViewer can get on the internet, then your end user can use that computer to get on the internet and download that thing that will encrypt everything. So, oh, sure. That's well, what, I mean, people doing their job have to get on, get on the internet. Uh, absolutely. I mean, they have and, to and that's what I'm saying is, 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 you know, when we're dealing with automation systems, that's what I'm getting at. You just, you can't do it as much as you want to and as much as it makes life easy. At some point, that's where it's going to, that's well, how it's going to happen. How would you handle then the following? A lot of programming now, I assume at your stations too, comes from FTP sites. You know, John Tesh, um, Dick Bartley and his oldies show, and plenty of other shows that we run in, in Greenville, Mississippi, we have to go download them every day. Now, we don't use an automation computer to do that. We use an intermediary computer that's also running a program that downloads FTP stuff. Well, like there, there's Mr. Master, Media Shooter Pro, uh, Web Gopher. These are all programs that, that <clears throat> either receive or go out and download FTP files, and then they format them for your automation system, whether it's... Uh, uh, Wide Orbit or uh, Rivendell in our case or, or others. And then that computer has to be, be looking at both networks, the internet, the business network with internet and the, and the uh, automation network without internet and make those formatted finished files available to the automation system. How that's, do you do that's, that? That's where you, well, that's where you get into that computer should be a server that doesn't have people accessing it to open those, those things going on. It should be segmented from, it should be able to see your internet, but not the rest of your building and then also your automation network. So what's going on there is that computer is downloading the FTP stuff. That's all it can do. That's all it's doing. And then dropping that into your automation system. The people who are opening these files that are going to scan for network shares aren't going to see it. So now you have a machine that is, you know, as secure as it's going to be and see the internet. Well, you, uh, you're, you're right in that nobody uses that machine except me and 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 the the technically adept station manager. So I mean, nobody is surfing the web or opening email on that machine. Right, but and that's what I'm saying. Is that if that machine only sees the internet and that machine yeah. only sees your automation system, and you know you've got the you know virus protection and those sorts of things on there, and all it does is use port 21 to connect to those servers and download things, then you're probably going to be okay. But when that PC is something that's sitting in a traffic office or something. Uh, oh, yeah. you know, your people are going to use it to surf and they're going to use it to open their email. And that's where you're going to have those infections. So, you know, it, it, you have to be smart about those things. I, it makes it easier to not do that. I get it. And, and that's the fight I always have with, you know, these stations that I do work for. I totally get it. And I don't want to make life more difficult, but trust me, you know, when that, when that happens and you lose everything, you know, you're going to go, why didn't I do that? Guys, we're going to run out of time here pretty soon. I do want to hear a couple of notes from Chris Tarr about the Wisconsin Broadcasters Association. So, Chris, if you get ready for that, our show uh, with uh, Tort 233 with Chris Tobin and Chris Tarr is also brought to you in part by my friends at Axia and the Axia Radius console. Now, there's there, there it is. It's this gorgeous little console. You can expand it. You can add more faders. If eight is not enough, you can add more faders to it. You can add a, a telephone controller. You can add uh, six faders and phone controller or six faders. Oh, there's one right there. There's Andrew smiling with his beautiful radius console. There's uh, Chris Tobin touching it because it feels good. And every bit of audio you hear on this network comes through that console. The same is true for uh, some other podcasting networks, too. And for literally 
thousand radio studios around the world. Um, well, not all are using Radius. Some of them are using Axie Elements or the Axie IQ console or, or the rack or the desk or even the original Smart Surface console. Point is, this proven technology, IP audio, is just amazing. And it's so easy to hook up. The difference between you know, connecting all those wires that you used to have to with all those inputs and outputs and mess and hooking up IP audio, uh, it's, just, it's, just, it's such a pleasure. I would never, ever go back to punching down multi-pair cables and oh man I just, uh, it, it hurts me to even think about it uh, the, the the radius console has features galore uh, processing EQ for for microphones um, uh, Again, easy to network with others. It'll network right in with uh, other, other Axia consoles. So you can, uh, in fact, I was in Dallas at a big facility where they have big element consoles from Axia in every control room and most of the production rooms. But in the news area and in little dubbing stations, they've got the, uh, the Axia radius consoles there. And they all network together. Uh, that they could do a traffic report. Uh, they, they can bring up any common um, uh, source to any of these consoles. And guess what? Any of these sources will talk back to that common source. You've got a satellite report coming in uh, or a, 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 a traffic report, something coming in over an IP codec or an ISDN codec, uh, even a POTS codec. Man, you could bring it right up on any console and talk right back to it from that same console. That's the flexibility of IP audio. Uh, if you don't understand IP audio and how the how the system works, no problem. I, I, I'm with you there. I had to read over this stuff like Steve Church's white paper five times before I even went, oh, this might work. <laughs> then installed a number of studios myself, and I think I'm finally getting it. There are videos on, on uh, YouTube. If you go to YouTube and go to the Telos Alliance channel, you'll find Axia videos there. I probably do a few of those myself. You can download brochures and manuals and, uh, and FAQs on the website. So check it out at axiaaudio.com. Point your browser there, axia, A-X-I-A, audio.com. And if there's only one console you look at, check out the Radius. As we say, throw your budget a curve and meet Radius. Thanks to Axia for sponsoring this week in Radio Tech. Chris Starr! All right. Man, we haven't talked to Tobin in a while. I'm sorry. Chris Starr, tell us about Wisconsin Broadcasters. All right. Looks like we got about, about a minute left, so I'll wrap yep. it up really quick. Uh, WBA, probably the best one they've done, uh, in the 10 or 11 years that I've gone, uh, they went over the, uh, the testing with the all digital AM, uh, in HD, uh, turning the analog component off and showed, you know, some of that, uh, speaking of IP audio, that is really kind of been the focus of this last session. Uh, a lot of discussion about AES 67, uh, Logitech mentioned that they're licensing Livewire now, yeah. uh, and, uh, you know, some great discussions on, on audio codecs, um, went through, uh, AM, uh, tuning, detuning AM towers, some of the rules involved with that. So really, uh, again, it was a, just a fantastic, uh, fantastic conference. They do a fantastic job every year in the fall, uh, three days, one day radio, one day, both radio and TV and one day TV. Uh, if you're in the Midwest and you haven't gone, what are you thinking? Uh, sign up for it. Uh, they do it every year. Great trade show. And uh, again, just a bunch of really good, good, solid technical programs. Thanks, Chris Tarr. And, and you know what? You and I need to talk about who put on uh, a presentation there that we need to have on the show as a guest. So let's okay. think about that together. Okay. Chris Tobin, any final thoughts from Queens, New York? Well, I, I was going to show off a new toy that I picked up, this little guy ah. here. But we'll have to wait for next week. So all I can tell you is it's from Sprint. It's a uh, uh -huh. pro live and that's it. That's all. It's a, it's an interesting device that uses cellular technology and a DLP projector. That'll be next week. Interesting. Yes. And as far as securing your facilities and trying to keep things going, it will be difficult, but try to use a unified uh, threat management system at the front door and also consider VLANs and there's a few other things. And VPN is probably your best bet, but use your own VPN appliances and approach. It's worth the trouble and effort that you go through. Team View and the mm -hmm. others are good, you know, ad hoc if you need to, but Chris is right. It's still a vector for trouble. And if you control all factors of access to your facility, you have a better chance of probably maintaining, you know, some simil similarities, not similar, um, semblance of, of sanity. Yeah. And also, what I used to do, and I know it can be time consuming, but it was well worth it. I would make mirror images of all of my machines and just keep them on the shelf. And, you know, every two weeks we'd make new I images and, just keep track. And let me tell you, we had a few times where things went batty 
and brought out the image, popped it in, and, and 20 minutes later, we're back up and running. And all it takes is a mirror. So um, we'll have you explain that next time. Yes. <laughs> Actually, and we need to have an expert on VPNs. You know, Dave Anderson implements VPNs all over the place in, uh, in uh, Microtech uh, router board routers. He might be one guy who could uh, give us a good show on that. So, hey, we'll work on that. We will get the information to engineers because this is a good place to get it. Thank you for watching This Week in Radio Tech. Thanks to Chris Tobin for making the trip to the studio in Queens, New York. Appreciate you, Chris. He's available at support at IPCodex. Dot com. If you've got a project, you need to understand uh, video, audio over IP, he can make it happen for you. And Chris Tarr from Muckwanago, actually Hales Corners, Wisconsin, right now. Chris Tarr, thank you. Good to have you back. Appreciate it. Good to be here. Be sure to uh, check me out on Twitter, at the Geek Jedi. At the Geek Jedi. All right. We got more places, I'm sure, that you're at to talk about. We'll have to do another time. Andrew Zarian, thank you for uh, switching and producing this episode of This Week in Radio Tech, and thanks to our sponsors, uh, Labo, Omni Audio, and Axia. We'll see you next time on This Week in Radio Tech. Bye-bye, everybody.